My name is Iran Flati. I'm 28 years old. I'm from Jerusalem, born and raised in Jerusalem. I'm an actually seventh generation in Jerusalem. Uh, my grandpa was born in the old city, he was a f fifth generation in Jerusalem. He was born in the middle of the old city in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. His mother died in birth. A Palestinian neighbor took him in and breastfed him. So he was actually a Palestinian Jew. This is how he knew himself. He grew up knowing Arabic before he knew Hebrew. All of his friends were Palestinians and some Jewish people that was there around him. Uh, my grandpa, from my father's side, that was born there, passed away uh, two and a half weeks ago in Jerusalem, uh, in his home. And Maya and me were debating if I should go back to do the Shiva, the, the, we in our religion of the seven days of mourning. And I was talking with my father, asking him if I should go back. And me and Maya talked and we decided that uh, it's much more important for me, at least, to continue to do this lecture in his memory. Because today, so many people, thank you, so many people today cannot imagine the possibility of Jews and Palestinians living together on the same piece of land. Although my grandpa was the living proof of it already happened a lot before Israel was established. So this is for my grandpa. So, hi. I grew up in Jerusalem in a very Zionist militaristic family. Like most of the families in Jerusalem or in Israel, Altogether, most of the families are Zionist. I guess you were aware of that, except for maybe the ultra-Orthodox Jews, that they are a very different species than all of us. But we are all grew up as Zionists. I grew up knowing that being a Zionist meaning being a Jew. It's the exact same thing. And being anti-Zionist or don't want to be a Zionist meaning being an anti-Semitic, hating all the Jews. If you're anti-Zionist, you want all the Jews to die. This is how I grew up at home. I grew up in a very militaristic home. My only brother, my older brother, was an officer in a special unit of the paratroopers in Israel. My mother was an officer in the Israeli army, and my father was a very high officer in the Israeli army. And until today, he's the head of investigation of the Jerusalem police. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm coming from a good legacy in my family. I grew up in, in my home in Jerusalem with my grandma and grandpa from my mother's side as well. And they came from Hungary after the Holocaust. And they were the only survivors of their family after the Holocaust. My grandma was an Auschwitz survivor. In a very early age, I grew up understanding that there's something wrong with the world. Because I saw my grandma and how she reacted to things, you know, with a lot of fear, with a lot of paranoia back at home. One of my first childhood memories was waking up in the middle of the night from screaming. My grandma used to wake up screaming in the middle of the night. She had dreams on Auschwitz, on the Holocaust, and all of the house would wake up very terrified. And my mom used to run into my room, me and my brother's room, and would calm us down and will explain to us, you know, why is grandma screaming? What is Auschwitz? What is the Holocaust? Why did they do it to the Jews? And I grew up knowing that I want to be a better human being. I grew up knowing that something so terrible happened, so the next time something like that happens, something terrible in history will happen, I will be there on the right place at the right time. I want to be this kind of man. I grew up starting to want to know everything I can about the Holocaust, so make sure it can never happen again in any way. So I grew up, and except for learning in school about what happened to the Jews, like all of the guys in school, I started to read about the Nazis. How would soldiers would go out in the morning to camps and go back at the afternoon or night to their families to tuck down their little babies to kiss their wife? That would drive me crazy. I read Mein Kampf when I was 15 years old. I became very, very much involved in the story of the Holocaust. And in the 11th grade, like most of my friends, like most of the people in Israel, I would find myself in a delegation on my way to Poland. I don't know, you can't see it really well, right? I don't know what you can do about the lights, but this is us in Auschwitz doing a trip of two weeks in, oh great, thank you. In all the camps, don't fall asleep. In all the camps in Poland, Every school in Israel sent their kids to do that. And after two weeks of going from camp to camp, the last camp was Auschwitz. This is Birkenau. And the last camp was Auschwitz. And I'm standing in the same camp that my grandma survived. And in some point, I'm standing in the same hut that my grandma used to sleep in. And exactly in that moment, and it was a very emotional moment for me, I'm getting a letter. The letter was from my grandma. My grandma wrote me a letter, and my mom sneaked it into the delegation through my guides. And I'm getting the letter, and the letter says, well, Iran, you're such a sweet boy, and you have such a big heart, and you're so sensitive, but I'm afraid that maybe you're too sensitive. 
It's very important to know everything you can about the Holocaust, that's for sure, you have to learn about that. But the Holocaust was not your fault. You don't need to take it upon yourself. You, don't, feel, you need, don't need to feel that you're a bad person because it happened or the world is a bad place. It's fine. Don't take it upon yourself anymore. I'm worried about you. It was the most sensitive and sweet letter I could get exactly at that moment. And I decided to read it to my friends. And the minute I finished the letter, one of my guides came up to me and said, well, Iran, you know what your grandma really wanted to tell you in the letter, right? I said, uh, yeah, sure, that I'm a very sweet boy and I got a very big heart and uh, I'm so nice. I said, no, what your grandma really wants to tell you is that a second Holocaust will happen and it will happen sooner than you think. And if you don't want to take it upon yourself that a second Holocaust has happened and you didn't do anything about it, you need to go back home, finish your school and join the best unit you can in the military to make sure that a second Holocaust will never happen. Not to your grandma's sakes, not to your sakes, on your kids' sakes, you have to do it. Whew, okay. I said, fine, if this is what my grandma wants. And then I went back home and I finished my school and I'm joining the IDF as a combat soldier. This is me, a young, handsome soldier at the IDF. I don't understand why people are laughing when I'm showing the picture. <laughs> I was a very young and handsome soldier in the IDF. And I'm joining the IDF and immediately being sent to boot camp. And boot camp was basically seven months of training for a war. For seven months, every day, we were training for a war, a war with Egypt, a war with Syria, with Lebanon, with Iran, for seven months, every day. But I guess it's a little confusing now because you know, Israel was not in a war in the last 40 years. Since 1973, Israel did not perform in a war in front of another army, another country, with airplanes, with tanks. We did operations in what we called uh, you know, uh, occupied land or terrorist group with uh, Hamas in Gaza or with Hezbollah in Lebanon, but we were not performing in a war. But nonetheless, all we did was getting trained for a war. And throughout the seven months, not once, we talked about Palestinians. And when the seven months was over, I was sent to a very different kind of war. I was sent to Palestine. And I find myself in the biggest Palestinian city in the West Bank, in south of Palestine, called Hebron or El Halil in Arabic. And I'm standing in a city of 180,000 Palestinians, and right in the heart of the city, in the middle of the city, there's a Jewish settlement. A settlement of 800 settlers, Jewish settlers, and around them there's 500 soldiers, like me, and there's 300 policemen, like my dad at the time. So why do we have to have police and army at the same place? Well, basically because we have two different kinds of people. We have Jewish settlers that although they're outside of the official borders of Israel, they are Israeli citizens. And they're getting all the perks of being an Israeli citizen, like letting the police handle their business, like any one of you. But then just next to them, next house, next door, next street over, there's the Palestinians. And they're, of course, not citizens of any states. And they're under our rule, under our 18, 19, 20 years old military law and we are controlling their life. And very fast, I will understand what my job is in Hebron. My job is to make sure that everybody in the city understand who calling the shots. It's us, the army, and the Jewish settlers around us. And very fast during my job, I noticed something I really, I really find it hard to understand. I had the power to close a complete city down. I would just have to walk down in the street and scream something like, Corfew. And everybody would close their shops and run to their home. Do you know what Corfew is or what the difference between a Corfew and a closure? So, so you know that closure, for example, is on a city, if the Jewish, uh, the, the Israeli army, I'm sorry, is performing a closure on a city because there's a Jewish holiday or a Jewish uh, special Shabbat or a special day in Israel, we just do a closure or a curfew. So a closure is on a city like Gaza or like Ramallah or any other city. You close up the city completely hermetically and then nobody can go in and out from the city. But a curfew is something a bit different. A curfew is everyone to his home. When I'm screaming curfew, everybody runs to their home and closing their door until a second notice. Meaning if right now the Israeli army will step outside and scream curfew, and we are all here right now, you know, make yourself comfortable because we're stuck together. And it already in the past was, you know, a few days or a few hours or a week or a few months of curfew happening. And very fast in my service, I would start doing curfews. And one Shabbat I had a, a weekend, or it was a special weekend in the Jewish uh, Bible and the Jewish uh, tradition, it's the, the piece of the Bible when Abraham is buying the Petro tombs in Hebron. 
So it's a special holiday for the Jewish settlers in Hebron, and there's thousands of settlers from all over the West Bank coming to the Hebron to do this weekend, and there's a lot of Israelis, thousands of Israelis coming from Israel to Hebron to do this weekend. It's a very special weekend, and of course, all the 180,000 Palestinians of the city have to go to Corfu. So we're calling the Corfu, and then we're getting a backup for that weekend alone of another unit. It's a special unit that specializes in terrorism. And in this unit, I have a very good friend from back home. And I'm seeing this friend, it's so funny, you know, it's so nice to meet a friend from back home in the middle of Hebron, and we want to speak, but we never have the chance because I'm doing all the day shifts of making sure that everybody is in their home, a curfew is being down, and he's doing all the night shifts. So we're just missing each other every time. And the last night of the weekend, I'm telling him, okay, tonight when I'm coming back, we're gonna sit for like five minutes, do a cigarette, a coffee, and you just tell me what's going on at home, what's going on with your girlfriend, saying, okay, we promise. And I'm coming back from the day shift, and he's just about to leave to the night shift, and we don't have any time again. So we're saying, okay, in the morning, and my friend is going to the night shift, and I'm going to sleep. And after a few hours of sleep, not a lot, I'm being waking up very hardly, and I open my eyes as my friend is leaning over me in the bed. And I'm asking him, what's going on? And my friend is just mumbling, and I'm looking outside and I see that half of his unit came back already a few hours earlier from the night shift. And his unit is in the base, and, but they're divided completely. Half of his unit is completely celebrating. You know, they're like going into the kitchen at 4 a.m. to get something to eat and they're singing. But half of the unit is just going around in the base and they look, look like, sh you know, they're in shock. They're completely stunned. So I'm starting asking my friend, what is going on? What is going on? And my friend is looking at me and saying, well, I think we just killed a little boy. I'm saying, what, what do you mean you think you just killed a little boy? It's this kind of thing you need to know. And my friend is telling me, I'm not sure. We were out there in the middle of the shift and we saw someone, we saw a figure out in the dark and he was holding something. And so we just start screaming at him, Corfu, and one of the guys just start shooting, so all of us just start shooting. And he just fell and we walked beside him and we noticed he's very small. So we just came back to the base. I had no idea what do I supposed to do with this information. I was 19. I was a few months in Hebron, and I didn't know the answer. So the best thing I could say at that moment was, okay, let's get some sleep. I will wake up with you early in the morning, and we, we can go together to that house, and we'll see what happened, and maybe we can apologize. And I was a very naive young soldier, because a few hours later, very early, before we had a chance to wake up, our officers came into the room and wake all the base up, all the base should be on their feet with a uniform and a helmet and grenades and ammunition and M16 getting ready to go out for a mission. Nobody knows what's going on, but the two units is getting up and getting ready and leaving the base and start marching with forced light in Hebron into the Abu Snena neighborhood of Hebron. And my friend who is in the other unit is looking at me and saying, this is the neighborhood we were last night. And I'm telling him, great, the minute we'll finish the mission, I'm going with you to that house, I promise. And we're going into the neighborhood and we're going into a street and my friend is looking at me and saying, this is the street when we were last night. And we're going down the street and we're just stopping in front of a house and we're getting orders to surround the house. And my friend is looking at me and saying, this is the house we were last night. And we're just standing there around the house for 20 minutes to understand what's going on. And after 20 minutes, we understand there's a funeral of a little boy supposed to come out from the house to the cemetery in Abu Snena neighborhood. But there's a curfew. There's a Jewish holiday. Nobody can leave their house. So our mission is to make sure that the funeral cannot go out of the house to the cemetery. And we're just standing there for minutes and minutes on until the father of the little kid is going out of, outside of his house and starts screaming at us. And he's screaming at us. At some point, he's pushing one of the officers away. And that really is something you cannot do in Palestine. You cannot push an officer away. So we just did what we do with everyone who's doing something he doesn't supposed to do in Palestine. We arrest him. And it's always the same way. It doesn't matter if he's you know, 85 years old or he's 80 years old. It's always the same way. We have a little piece of plastic in our weapon and we're just tying him behind his back very tightly. We have a piece of fabric in our weapon, we just blindfold him. And we're just taking the father and throwing him 
into the military jeep. And the mother of the kid that was killed, seeing that we just arrested our husband, is getting outside of the house. And she starts screaming at us. And she's screaming at us and screaming at us and screaming at us. And it was so deep that all of a sudden I understood that I already heard this screaming before. She was screaming exactly like my grandma used to wake us up with every night when I was a kid. And I didn't know a word in Arabic. I didn't understand what she's saying, but I understood everything that she meant in her screaming. And I just couldn't handle her screaming, so I just volunteered to take the father to the base to arrest him. And I just jumped into the jeep and just drove away. And we got to the base and I just put the father in the entrance of the base like we did with most of the people that we arrested. And I just went back to my bed and put the blanket over my head and trying to make it go away. But it didn't. And that was the first time out of many that I will understand that history is knocking on the door right now. And I'm on the wrong side. All of my life I was waiting to be on the right side, but I was on the wrong side all these months. And everything just snapped in my head. And I just had to shut myself down. I just shut myself down completely. My father, like many times before that, will call me and will tell me that the IDF spokesman talked about us retrospective after a few days. He will tell me that the IDF spokesman gave an announcement about our unit in Hebron. He said that our unit managed to kill the terrorist and to arrest another terrorist that tried to help him in his job in this weekend. And my mind was just not there anymore. And I just snapped. I closed up my head and continued to do my service. Day after day after day after day, continue to do the same thing. I will go into houses in the middle of the night. I will arrest people. I will arrest children, sometime under the age of 10 or 8, alone. I will arrest women and elderly people. I will shoot at protesters, live ammunition sometimes, rubber bullet or tear gas canister. I will do everything that I will be required in the next half a year, six months. I will just do everything like i supposed to. But when I'm starting to come home during the weekends, I understand that I cannot go back to be the same person I was. I understand that you cannot be the same person at home and a soldier at the army. You have to choose an I without no chose that I'm a soldier. So I'm going back home and I'm just not myself and I'm literally, literally could not recognize my face in the mirror. My mother is starting to tell me that I became a very violent man to them, to my parents. My girlfriend at the time is breaking up with me and I'm completely on the edge. So I'm deciding to do something I didn't thought I would do. I'm taking my phone and I'm calling an old friend from back home. And we don't really like him because he's kind of a lefty friend. He's the leftiest friend of the group and he's coming from a lefty family so nobody really liked this guy. But I'm giving him a call. You know, and the only reason I really have his number is because he's like really good at basketball so we keep in touch. So I'm calling my friend and I'm telling him, man, you have to understand what I'm going through. I have to tell you, you're the only one who can Listen to me, you're the only one I can think about calling. And my friend said, whoa, whoa, wait, what's going on? And I'm telling him, I have to tell you what I saw. And he's saying, okay, go. And I'm just starting to tell him this story and many else worst sometimes stories about the last six months of my service. And I'm telling him story by story by story. And at some point, my friend is telling me, whoa, whoa, wait, run. okay, stop, stop. Okay, listen, if you're really in such a bad shape, if you're really on the edge, if you really understand what's going down there, would you consider coming with me next Friday when you're leaving the base to a protest with anarchists against the wall in the village of Berlin? And I'm saying, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> anarchists against the wall? Are you, you know, whoa, are you crazy? Anarchists, I don't, Mohawk, Eriks, I don't know what, what anarchists are. They're, it's crazy, people, no way, I am out. I'm not going there. And he's saying, Iran, what do you got to lose? And I understand that I really don't have anything to lose at that moment. So I'm saying yes. And the next Friday I can, I'm leaving the base. Instead of going back to Jerusalem, I'm going to Tel Aviv. I'm putting my uniform in my civilian bag. I'm putting civilian clothes on me. And I find myself on a bus, on a bus, sorry, of anarchists against the wall to the village of Berlin. 
The village of Belin is a small village in the middle of Palestine that a separation barrier, the separation wall is cutting the village in, mid, in the middle, taking half of the land and half of the olive growth to the other side of the wall, just ruining their work and life of decades and just taking it to the other side of the wall. And since 2004, I think, the people of Belin, is, it's now it's exactly nine years. It was this Friday, the last Friday was exactly nine years to the protest. Every Friday, nonviolent protest marches against the wall, against the soldier, against the occupation, marching to the wall, screaming to the soldier, leave, the, leave our land, leave the, take with you the, your checkpoints, take with you your wall, and they're marching. And I'm getting into Belin, and I'm scared shitless. <laughs> I am so scared. I was never on a Palestinian ground, surrounded by Palestinians, without my M16, my two hand grenades, my six packs of ammunition, and my backup. Never. Everybody is talking in Arabic around me, and the only words I knew in Arabic was uh, strip down and give me your ID. So I, I couldn't say that. So <laughs> I was really stuck in the middle of the village, very much afraid. And then the march, the marching was starting. And back then it was still a fence. Today is a 20 feet concrete wall. And they're starting to march into the fence. And there's some drummers, and there's some singing, and some signs. And we're just marching. And I'm marching with them, and I'm so scared. And then in the corner of my eye, I see a few young men rising up and throwing some stones in the direction of the fence. And then immediately, 360 around us, we're surrounded by military army units. All around us, the Israeli army is popping up and just start shooting, without saying a word, just start shooting into our body. And they're shooting rubber bullets, and I don't know if you ever know that, but rubber bullets are not rubber bullets. They're still bullets with a little rubber around them. I didn't know that, and they're shooting rubber bullets into our body, and shooting tear gas canisters into our body, and I was never shot at before. I shot at people before, but nobody ever shot at me. And I was so afraid that the only thing I could think about saying was just, stop shooting, stop shooting, I'm an Israeli soldier! I'm an Israeli soldier, stop shooting! And then one of the anarchist guys looking at me like this, saying, I'm an Israeli soldier too! You can stop shooting! And then a bunch of Palestinians are coming and saying, we are all Israeli soldiers! You can stop shooting! <laughs> I was not laughing. Because they didn't stop shooting. And then the tear gas started to kick in. And I know if you ever got tear gas, we tried it a little bit in booth camp, but it was nothing like that day in Berlin. The tear gas started to kick in, and tear gas basically just closed you up completely. You feel that you cannot breathe. It just choke you up. You cannot take air inside. And until today, I'm not sure if tear gas is working here or it's working here, but it's working. And you feel that you cannot breathe. And my instinct was to try to run away from the gas, but just made it worse. So I find myself on four in the middle of the village, trying to breathe, thinking, this is how I'm going to die. And after a few moments, a few young Palestinian men just ran across from me. And one of them saw me, came back, and just grabbed me with him and ran with me into his home, in the village. He set me down in his home. He gave me some onion. Apparently, it's very good for that. And some alcohol pads until I could feel that I breathe again. <sighs> I went out of his house, back to my home, to this weekend, and I knew this is it for me. I will never go back to do the same things again, ever. But then Sunday came, and I'm taking up my uniform, and I'm taking my gun, and I'm going back to Hevu. Because this is the only reality we know to be true in Israel. I didn't have any friends who didn't serve at this time. I didn't have any family member I can tell that I don't want to go back. So I'm going back, but this time I'm promising myself things will be different. And I'm continuing to go into protests with anarchists against the wall. And after a few weeks, they met me up in Tel Aviv with Doctors Without Borders. You know Doctors Without Borders? So they met me with the Israeli branch of Doctors Without Borders. And I will sit there, and they will ask for my help, and will explain to me their very specific situation in Doctors Without Borders, Israel. They're telling me, you know, all the Palestinians in the West Bank, if they want to get to hospitals or get in medicine, get in treatment, have to go through checkpoints into Israel proper or through the West Bank. They have checkpoints between their land to their land and they have to go through it. And if they want to go through the checkpoints, they have to have permits from the military, humanitarian permits to go to a hospital. And all of you, of course, know that the Israeli army is the most moral army in the world, right? So you know the Israeli army is already taking out the permits. 
It does. But instead of giving it to the sick Palestinians, it's giving it to the lawyers of Doctors Without Borders that are arresting them every day. And then all they need to do is to make sure they don't, don't let anyone from Doctors Without Borders or representative go through the checkpoints into the West Bank and give these permits into sick hands of Palestinians. And this is how the Israeli army is basically making sure in a legal aspect that it's protected from every angle. Nobody can complain. During this time, my mother is dying out of cancer back home in Jerusalem. And I'm finding myself in the next year and a half sneaking out of my base in the middle of the night with my uniform and my vest and my gun, going into houses in the middle of Hebron and later on South Mar Hebron, knocking on the door. This time, I will be as a guest. And I will go inside and give people permits to go through checkpoints and medicine. Wow. And in return, I will hear their stories about what it is to live under a military occupation. And during this time, I meet countless women with breast cancer in Palestine. The number is unknown to anybody because there's nobody taking track. But during this time, my mother is dying back home and I can see the exact same things going on. And my mind just going wider and wider. During this time, I'm hearing about a little group called Breaking the Silence, a young group of veteran soldiers, combat soldiers, that collecting testimonies from other soldiers across the West Bank and publish it into the Israeli public and international people. What is the truth inside these occupied territories? And I decided I want to tell my story, my mother's story, this woman's story. And I'm starting to give them stories from inside the army. And the day I released from the army, I joined Breaking the Silence. And for the next two and a half years, I will become their chief investigator. We'll take testimonies from more than uh, 250 soldiers from the West Bank and Gaza, and we'll try to publish it into the Israeli public and abroad. And I know that the occupation is that close to be ended with, because the people of Israel didn't hear my story yet. And after they hear my story, the occupation will have to drop, right? <laughs> But a few months go by and nothing changed and the testimonies that I'm collecting doesn't do anything. And then Operation Kestlet start. And Operation Kestlet was so bad. We sat back at home and tried to understand what's going on, but nobody told us what's going on down in Gaza. So I'm finding myself going from breaking the silence office into the border with Gaza, just standing there outside of the border, waiting for soldiers to go out of the operation to tell me what was going on inside. And after three weeks, soldiers are starting to come out from, the from Gaza. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them will pass through me and will tell me their stories. And they were very, very confused. A lot of people think they were very mad or very happy in Operation Kassad, but they weren't. They were very confused because those soldiers were training for years and months to be handling a war. And they got their war when they got to Gaza. They saw tank shells just bombing everything in sight for them. They saw Air Force, the Israeli Air Force, just dropping ton bombs on civilians, clearing the path for them to go in. They saw white phosphorus falling from the sky, burning everything it touches along the way. But until it was their time to go by foot into Gaza, there was no enemy left. Just hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of dead bodies around them every day of the operation. And they came out very confused. And in the next three months, I will collect testimonies from everyone I can, that I can, that serve inside Gaza during this time. And we'll put a booklet down of breaking the silence, a booklet of testimonies from op Operation Castlet. But before we go going out with it to the Israeli public, we want to make sure this time we have a good platform so people will listen. It's important enough. So we're going to the most lefty newspaper in Israel. What is the most lefty newspaper in Israel? Haaretz. Everybody knows Haaretz all the time. It's weird. Yeah, so I'm, we're turning to Haaretz. And I'm talking with Amos Salel, the military reporter of Haaretz, and I'm telling him the stories and him saying, whoa, if this story is true, you guys are getting a cover story. Mm -hmm. And he's verifying the stories for two weeks. And after two weeks, he's saying, it's going to come out this Friday. And all of us on Friday go out to the stores and buy in all the hours we can, but there is no cover story. Mm -hmm. And there is no backstory or middle story. So we're going back to the office and we're calling the Alice Auditorium and saying, what happened? And they will explain to us, basically, yesterday we got a phone call from the IDF spokesman. 
And the IDF spokesman gave us two options. Or you're going with breaking the silence, or you're going with me. But if you're going with breaking the silence, I'm not working with you anymore. And the Harvard's editorial is continuing to explain to us and saying, you know, we don't really have investigative reporters in Gaza or in the West Bank, except for maybe Amira Haas. So we really rely on the IDF spokesman to give us the truth from these territories. And I'm hanging up the phone and I'm flipping through the book that the Israeli public will not read anymore. But then I noticed there's holes in the stories. There's a few stories in the booklet, our booklet, that's missing completely, and there's a few booklets with holes in the middle of them. So I'm going to my boss at the time, to Yehuda, and I'm saying, what is going on? There's holes in the story, and he's saying, oh, that's fine, that's fine. This is only what the IDF censorship took down. And I'm saying, what? I'm saying, oh, come on, Aaron, don't be naive. You you, you know that they, every news channel in Israel, every TV channel, every radio station, every blogger on the internet or newspaper have to go through the idea of censorship, right? And I'm saying, no, I didn't know that. We don't have free press. This is amazing. But wait, wait. We're breaking the silence, right? right? We're breaking this silence. And Yehuda is looking at me and saying, oh, yeah, we're breaking this silence that the idea of, spokes, uh, the idea of censorship allows us to break. <laughs> And I understand that my days in the organization is numbered. And after a few months, I will go out for Baker the Science and will continue to do the same kind of work, only by my own. I will collect testimonies from soldiers, from officers. I will collect stories from people outside of the army, very, uh, the biggest officials inside the military and security industry in Israel. Collect their stories and get it back, instead of breaking the silence, to the reporters of the Times, to the Guardian, a lot of the story, to the Washington Post, to BBC. I will start to press the send the stories outside and they will publish. Not fully, but a lot of them will publish outside. And during this time, I'm discovering something pretty amazing. The more I go in looking for occupation, the more I find money. And I don't understand, so I'm going deeper and deeper. And then in 2010, I'm getting into a very interesting story about how the Israeli government and Israeli army was selling a new tear gas canister into the government of police, uh, Singapore, of, uh, the police and government of the Singapore people. They're selling tear gas canister to fight their protest in their country. And during this time, I'm looking and I'm saying, Israel is selling tear gas canister? So I'm going to, into the website of the sec Minister of, of Security in Israel, and I find out they're saying that Israel just concluded a deal with the Singapore government of selling the best tear gas canister ever produced and tried by the Israeli army. And it was he mentioned there a few lines later that this tear gas canister was proven to be the most deadliest ever. And I'm going back and I'm saying, wait, try the tear gas canister. Who would be agreed to be tried? And then I understand. They're trying the weapons every day. Not in labs, down there on the field. They're trying their weapons. I was trying their weapons in Bilin, in Yalin, in Falkadum, in Abi Salah, in, Be in Bethlehem, in Hebron. El Halil, South Manchevon, in East Jerusalem. We're trying the weapons every day and then we're selling it outside. And I couldn't believe the things that I'm seeing, so I'm going deeper and deeper. And then I realized that, you remember this guy, the young guys that threw stones in the beginning of the protest? They were not Palestinians. They were actually an undercover unit of the Israeli army looking like me, Arab Jews, disguised as Palestinian inside these villages, starting a riot, starting something, so the Israeli army will have a good excuse to start shooting the place up and testing the weapons. And the more I go, the more I can understand. Is this for real? How long is it going through? How much money are we making? I'm going in and in, and then I discovered in the last 30, 40 years, and this is a very, very partial list, this is the dictatorships and regime that the Israeli government and the Israeli army is trading weapons with, trading knowledge with, trading technology or training their soldier by themselves in those countries. In the last 40 years, we were involved in the worst dictatorships and regimes in the world. And we were making a killing out of it, literally. We are making so much money out of it. And then I understand. This is not an occupation, it's a laboratory. Sometimes as a soldier, I would infuse poison to Palestinians. Sometimes as a protester, I will run away with Palestinians and be in a lab rat. But all this time, we're trying weapons out and selling them out there in the source of everything. It's not a religion, 
It's not the land. There's a lot, a lot of money. And I understand that I'm standing in the wrong place. And I'm moving to New York City from Jerusalem. It's a big change. And I'm standing in New York City, and the last three years, I'm researching the relationship between our army and your army, our government and your government, and all the money that flows in the middle. Now, I'm going to do a cut just for a second and do a different ending than usual. We're doing it in the last few, pro, uh, few last lectures, and I want to try it now. Two and a half months ago, we were on the Maryland Highway on our way to do this kind of lectures in Washington, D.C. And we were on our way, we crashed our car in the middle of the Maryland Highway, and we were stuck in the middle of the highway. People were driving next to us, and we did something we don't really like to do, we called the police. And the police came very fast, very efficient. The Maryland officer police came and took us out of the highway, tall car came and took mine and another friend with our car to the lot, and I got a ride along with the Maryland officer police. And for 10 minutes, we're driving silently, and I have no idea it's going to change my life, this ride. And we're driving quietly, and then the guy is looking at me, the officer of the Maryland police is looking at me and saying, so, where are you from? And I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm, from, Pal I'm from Israel. I'm from Israel. And the officer is saying, oh, man, you guys are bad asses. You know how to silence the one that opposed you. You know how to calm them down. Nobody disobey you. You guys are the best. And I'm saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't think you really know a, a lot about the Israeli army, so, you know, never mind. I'm saying, oh, no, no. I just came back from there. I'm saying, what, as a tourist? I'm saying, no, with the Maryland police. We just came back from training with your military and your police. I'm saying, what? I'm saying, Oh yeah, you know all of our police here in the U.S. is going to a few weeks to Israel and trained with your army and your police. And I'm still starting investigating more and more, getting more information out there. And then before I leave the house, I, before I leave the car, I'm sorry, the, his car to the lot, I'm thinking, is there a chance you know Shlomo Ifrati? My father, the head of investigation of the Jerusalem police? And the guy takes out his cell phone and flipping pictures. And he got a picture hugged with my dad in the middle of the night in Washington, D.C. And I'm just blown away. I'm going out of the car and I'm calling my dad in Jerusalem. And I'm saying, Dad, what the hell? And my dad is telling me, oh, come on, Irani, don't be naive. You know NYPD got an office in Tel Aviv, right? You know we got an office in New York, right? Come on, we're working together to protect you. And then I understand. It wasn't the first time, but that was my closure. For years, we're doing this kind of lectures, very different kind of lectures, and talking with communities here in the US, telling them that all they need to do is take care of their community, and it's going to be fine. Every one of us will take care of our community. But you should know that you know what's going on in Palestine is a humanitarian crisis. And I'm going around, and I'm telling them, I learned something growing up. All of us want to be on the right place at the right time when history is knocking on the door. And history is knocking right now, really loud in Palestine. And all of you need to be on the right side on this humanitarian case, but not this time. If you don't care about Palestinians after this lecture, I don't care. And if you don't care about us, Israel is asking for your help to stop the apartheid regime in Israel. I'm fine with that also. But you guys should know, you are next in line. The next one who will die from a tear gas canister into his chest will be in Zuccotti Park, will be in Denver, will be in Oakland, in San Francisco. It is happening here already. It's happening to different people, to people of color, to immigrants in this country. It's already happening. You guys are next in line. The next one who will die out of brutality of the police will be one of your sons or your daughters in a protest because they're training together. Your police training with our army. Our army is training them how to take care of the enemy because Palestinians are our enemy. But when they're coming back, you are their enemy. All this time when we are taking care of our communities, I was taking care of mine and you were trying to take care of yours. They, the government, the police, they were organizing together globally to oppress us. We need to start organizing globally to resist them. And that start in Palestine right now. Stopping the training there will stop it here.
This is why I joined in 2005 the civil society call of the Palestinians for boycott, divestment, and sanction on the state of Israel, taking it out from the source, non-violently from the money, taking the money out of the equation. How many lives can we save? Everybody knows the apartheid regime will stop. The question is how fast and how many people is going to die there and here until it will happen. We need to start organizing globally to resist them. I hope you'll join us to the call of BDS, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.